Um, so, Couch Model, this is our first interview. Um, I'm honored. Uh, couch Modeling came to me in this um, moment of feeling really anxious and um, down and needing a creative outlet and it kind of came out of nowhere and um, and really exercised those muscles that I was needing to exercise and brought me a lot of joy and a lot of laughter and um, I have continued doing it because it still is bringing me a lot of joy and a lot of laughter and what's come from doing that and um, regularly talking about why I'm doing couch modeling has been kind of this overall theme of anxiety and um, how you curb yours. And so um, you and I have been, I would say best friends for the last 10 years. I have a million best friends, but I have one Chris Dahlman. Um, we talk every day. Every day, I throughout the day. I am, a huge support of you and you are a huge support of me and everything that I do and um, when I started doing this it just was like a no-brainer for you to be supportive and then um, about a year ago <clears throat> around the same similar timing I'd say um, you started crocheting and um, from that you and I kind of collaborated and that's what this interview is going to be a lot about because we did a whole collection that we shot doing a couch model shoot with your clothes. So um, couch modeling is my um, anxiety medicine in a way, you know, there's therapy, there's anxiety, antidepressants and there's all these different um, wonderful necessary tools but there's also these things that I've found the more I've talked to people that like you need in your life to make you a whole person. And so like the couch modeling is my couch modeling. What is your couch model? You know, um, without hesitation, I would say my couch model is crochet. It has um, enhanced my life in such an amazing way. It's given me, um, it's given me you know, an anxiety relief. It's given me an outlet for my creativity that is not performance based. For many years, I was a musician, and um, as much as I love writing songs, the actual performance aspect of it never quite worked hand in hand with my anxiety. So it's been it's been nice, sort of rechanneling all of that creativity into this. And um, you know, I started. Yeah, I started kind of finding myself because a lot of it honestly has to do with the fact that crocheting is not typically associated with, you know, masculine energy. And it's been really amazing for me to just not worry about that and just to like open myself up to this passion of mine that you know, kind of transcends gender boundaries because I, for the most part, make women's clothes. <laughs> it's not what I expected ever, but um, I, for this model, for this interview, I just need to disclose, I've allowed myself an extra cup of coffee today. Good. Um, it is which is exciting, but also um, dangerous. So we'll see what comes out. <laughs> Um, how did you start crocheting? What was the first piece that you made? The first thing that I ever made was, um, I tried to make a scarf for my then, uh, 19 year old cat, Becca Boo. Um, I don't recall why I was drawn to it initially, but the way that I taught myself was by, um, YouTube. Um, I follow, I found a tutorial, a person who does crochet tutorials. Her name is Bella Coco. I believe she's Australian. And I learned my basic stitches from her, 
the first thing, it's funny because it showed up in my Facebook memories um, not too long ago, like within the last couple of weeks. And A, it was so cute to see my cat again because he's since passed on. But, but, um, but B, it was just wild because it was such a great, it was wild because the, the piece itself was terrible. I mean, it was just terrible. The stitches were all messed up. But I've grown so much in such a short amount of time. And it's like, you know, we forget in life that that's kind of how things go. You know, you work at something. And obviously you have things that you're, you know, more talented at than others, naturally. But, you know, I worked re- I've worked really hard. It clicked with me. And I've grown just, it's just exploded in my life. I remember the first blanket you made was like 80 pounds. Um yeah, yeah, because, it's well, so you know, when I was, you, you don't learn, especially when I, I'm, I tend to be a very shy person when it comes to being in, like, a store or, like, that sort of situation, so I never really ask questions. I just really try to learn all by myself, and that leads me to a lot of different roadblocks um, that I've learned to solve on my own, and now I'm in a place where I consider myself pretty educated on the different fibers and what I should be using and the stitches that I should be but back then it was just single crochet, which is like the tightest little stitch that you can do. And it was with like really thick yarn. So it was like, I, it's funny, my dad still has this blanket that I made him. It's draped over his couch and it's quite pretty, but it's like when you have it on you, it's like a weighted blanket. And yeah. It's only made out of yarn. It's like a sheath of armor. <laughs> um, well, and the so, first blanket you made me was well over a year ago, I think. Right? Yeah. And uh-huh. That piece is beautiful and Thank you so well made. Much. Um, it is well made, but the problem with that piece, if I recall, though it does photograph well just by seeing my um, sneak peeks of the upcoming Couch Model content, the problem with that was that I, I it wasn't like a perfect square. So like when you mm. fold it, it's all like messed up. But you know, again, that was a that was a learning curve. What I'm making now is this tiny little baby dress. Um, absolutely love it. Oh, um, so cute. And I'm using a very fine um, hand dyed cotton yarn and a 2.25 millimeter hook. So it's taking me a really long time because the stitches are tiny. But it, what I love about it is that it doesn't look crafty. Like one of the things about it, crochet is really big right now. Like not necessarily the action of making it, but people wearing crochet is like a pretty popular thing at the moment. And, and like, a lot of it looks really crafty and intentionally, like it's sort of macrame-ish, but I'm really also drawn equally to something that looks more like a traditional, a traditional garment and these tiny little stitches just get me closer to that goal. Um, so you made me a blanket and then, um, it was around the beginning of winter and you needed more things to make. You started yes. asking me what I wanted, and the first thing you made were these headbands for me for when I go hiking. Yeah. Um, and, you know, we started talking about colors that I liked and um, the actual design of what I wanted, and then I think it just kind of spiraled in a good well, way. We realized, we realized that we work really, really well together. Something that I texted you the other day, a direct quote from my text messages is that I really love collaborating with you because you like help focus my taste and it's like it's just wonderful so like just for backup for people watching this you know I'll be like what do you want or I'll just like send you a link to something or you'll send me a picture of something and I'll say like if it's a picture from you I'll say like let me look around and see what I can find um, if it's a tutor- if it's like a, a pattern that I could you know possibly make, you'll say yes or no, and then we'll start talking colors, and it's just like it's one of my favorite things. Um, and do you feel like it has helped having these projects has, has helped um, with anxiety, especially during the winter months here in Milwaukee? It's cold. Yeah, for sure. Well, it keeps me busy. Um, the this therapist that I went to uh, one time that I did not continue going to see um, did say, and I don't, I don't know how true this is, but this is like 
crochet is like your crochet or knit or any sort of like thing with your hands is like your it's detail oriented it's like your left brain and your right brain like kind of like pendulously working together um, and I don't know if that's real as I said but I do um, I do feel that way I just feel this like wonderful balance if you throw in like some some music or like um, perhaps a television show or a film that I've already seen that I'm you know familiar with and really fond of and just to have on in the background um, it's just like the most wonderful thing additionally I as I mentioned was always a, a, a musician and I most of my money went toward that and I didn't make a lot of money um, so I was never really a big gift giver and beginning to make wearable pieces that I'm able to gift to people or to their to their babies um, has made me feel so good and it's because I was never really able to participate in the gift giving culture and it's just like to make something that fits somebody's body you know like I, I, I made you you know six seven pieces wearable pieces that you're gonna show in your upcoming couch model content but like the the one that really really gets me is the sweater that everyone will see because it's like it just fits you so well and like it, the, the it has these puffy exaggerated sleeves and like the exaggeration of the sleeves works perfectly like with the size of your face and the size of your body and like the dimensions of your body and like that just blows me away a that i can do something like that but b that it like really looks good yeah um, and like and so I think anytime you feel like you're successful at something, that alleviates a certain type of, a certain aspect of anxiety. Um, because it just boosts your confidence, and in many ways, anxiety is, you know, a lack of confidence. I mean, that's not all that it is, but um, yeah. so so it's fear such a relief. Well, was that? Sorry. It, it's, such a, it's such a reliever of anxiety. I'm having so much fun chatting, by the way. Oh, good. <laughs> um, Chris, tell me about your couch. Oh, my couch. Well, this couch is new. Um, it's, I, I can't imagine life without it. Um, it's an L couch. It's our first L couch. It's not quite, it's not our very first brand new couch. When we lived in Los Angeles in the San Fernando Valley, we, we bought like a $400 couch from one of those furniture stores like on Magnolia or like on Burbank or something like Lankersham or Lankersham yes or on Lankersham <laughs> and like it was so it was like this like that what that couch did is it taught me the value of a good couch because that was a bad couch it was made out of like faux suede it was hard the arms were like hard so like there was no like potential to like you know relax which, which is you know crucial so yeah. it just wasn't good we didn't have good support when we moved to milwaukee six years ago um it coincided with my parents who are both who are separate who are divorced um both of them were moving out of the houses that they were living in and they have a lot of furniture so they were like please take all of our furniture as we were looking to furnish the house that we had just purchased. And, uh, and so we then took this couch that my parents bought in 1991 that I had been in my life, obviously since then. And it's a wonderful couch. It did, however, get very beat up. It was, you know, 30 years old. Plus the, we got a puppy. He murdered it. So then my dad came over one day and he's like, you know, you guys need a new couch. And we were like, yes, we do. So we went to, um, Ashley Home Furnishings. We tried a few couches. This actually one, this one was not my first choice. Um, I was worried about um, the the leather aspect of it, and my my I have two cats plus a dog, and I was worried about the nails scratching. But my husband Josh was very into this couch, and it was a beautiful marriage moment where I was like, oh, it does not have to be my way, and it went his way, and he was just. <laughs> It was just not wrong at all. This is absolutely the right couch. We can both lay on it, as well as our dog, all sprawled out, and we don't have to touch if we don't want to. 
we all have a great view of the television. Um, and it just, it's nice to sit on. I fall asleep on it almost every night. My pattern is to fall asleep on the couch around 8.30 and then move to the bed between 10.30 and midnight. Um, so. Where are you most comfortable? In life or just when relaxing? You know, I would say on the couch because I do have that pattern. You know, I mean, I spend, I'm not one that crochets in like a hard wooden straight back chair. I don't, we don't have an armchair because this L couch takes up the whole room. Um, and I've never been an armchair person. And when you need, when you're crocheting, you need a little bit of this room. And then your yarn can't be all like scrunched in by you. So um, I would say the couch, you know, I, I sit here, I work here, I sleep here for a period of time. And then I move to the bed and I do sleep quite well in my bed, but our, our bedroom is small and, um, I just believe, I've always said that I just kind of believe the bed is for sleeping and sex and not for, not for like, like we don't have a television in our bedroom or anything like that. Um, I was actually just saying this because I had a day off the other day and I was so excited to just relax in my bed for a little while and I do really ease into my day. I love relaxing in my bed, but the longer I spent in my bed, I was like, all right, I'm starting to feel really anxious. I'm kind of starting to feel like this dark aura and um, I had to get up and was the only way to fix that. Um, yeah. When I have, when I love being comfortable and I love the couch so much, it was interesting to kind of go, okay, well, like the bed is not my safe place. Like the couch is. <laughs> no, but you have always been that sort of, that type of waker upper. You like, know you ease into the moment of deciding whether or not you're going to stand up and yeah. like that's just not me I'm like boom I wake up boom I stand up yeah and then I make my coffee and I crush it um healthy for me to know not to do that on my next day off um what is something that you've considered uncomfortable that um you did anyway and it paid off in the end well, um, I'll give you two answers. The short one, crochet. It was uncomfortable at first. You have to learn how to do it, how to hold the, the how to hold the yarn, how to hold the crochet hook, and then how to make the stitches, and then how to make it go in like a rhythmic way where you're, you know, making the magic happen. I'm not comfortable when I don't know how to do something. Yeah. And so there's that. Um, the the longer answer, the better answer is, um, as I mentioned, I'm. And my husband is a, is a theater director, actor, and playwright. And we, um, we recently collaborated on a musical that we wrote together called The Potter's Healer. And um, I've been a very reluctant participant throughout um, the whole thing. He, you know, when I say we, we collaborated, it really, what that means is that he took, you know, some finished songs of mine that had been, you know, recorded as well as some unfinished songs that um, you know that he worked on a little bit, and then and then I was coaxed into working on, um, and then finally he got it together this summer, um, just in June, to um, he cast a reading, a workshop of our of our musical, and I was just terrified because I haven't performed in years, um, you know I don't I don't have I I I think that. There's some good stuff that I've made, but I don't have a real consistent confidence in my music. And I was just terrified. And I was terrified to work with these actors and are they gonna like what they were, you know, are they gonna like the material? And we just did it. I just did it. And I, it was one of the first times that my anxiety felt, you know, nearly eliminated. And when I, when I, when I give a lot, I give, a, you know, as I, as I said, I give a lot of credit to crochet uh, because you need, to, you need to find some physical, you know, material things, tactile things to do in this world to, you know, exercise those muscles that you, you know, tip that can otherwise be um, occupied by worrying. But, you know, at the same time, I also have to give a lot of credit to the medicine that I'm on. I'm on an anti-anxiety medicine. I'm on an antidepressant, and I'm also on 
about medicine for ADHD, and those three things all work together. Those three medicines all work together, along with me making healthy choices, along with me finding wonderful things to do, like crocheting and those things. Those are the ways that I get over my fears, and those are the ways that I, you know, build the confidence to do something that absolutely terrifies me, because the reality is there is, in my experience, no better feeling than doing something that you were scared of doing. A gray area because there are lots of times where something is scary and you're like nope not gonna do that and that's okay too but doing something that's in your wheelhouse that you know inside you you want to do and you know inside you should do and you know you're gonna grow from it um, that's once you do stuff like that that's the best feeling in the world and just as like an upside participant in watching this you know the clip that you sent me of these kids singing your songs were really incredible. It was awesome to hear these songs that I had heard previously recorded in this theatrical tone, and it was just like a really cool experience on my end, too. I'm so glad. It really was, you know, really, that aspect was really wild for me. I mean, there were a couple of times throughout my musical career where other singer-songwriters would cover, you know, a song of mine, and that was always really thrilling. This was like that notched up because not only were they bringing you know, not only was I hearing another voice interpret my songs, they were also bringing this whole new element to it of theatricality that just, I was like, wow, I'd never thought about them in those terms. And, and they were quite successful in those terms. And that was just like, I mean, I had just got chills right now. <laughs> um, and then lastly, just because I like to laugh, I need you to tell me the last thing that made you laugh or, and, and or, the last time that, the, the, a time that you can think of that you and I laughed the hardest. Oh my God. Wow, on the spot. Let me see if I have another <laughs> sip of coffee for this okay. one. I mean, we laugh all the time. That's part of the thing. So it's hard to remember, but I mean, I'm like one, really funny, right? one amazing time of us laughing. We had great times. I mean, back up, the back story is that Maya and I met because we worked together at a restaurant and, um, you know, worked on the floor together. And there's just nobody that I would rather spend, you know, six to eight hours in that back and forth of, you know, hard work and socializing. So there was just like so much laughter. One time when we were there, um, we were, uh, w one thing we did was we would manifest celebrities that we wanted to come in, and oftentimes it worked, and it was just made for an incredible celebrity lunchroom. One time we were trying to manifest Connie Britton, we were very into Friday Night Lights at the time, and there were a handful of Friday Night Lights actors that would come in, all of whom were very, very sweet, might I add. Um, and so we manifested Connie, she came in, and she picked up a matcha latte to go. First of all. Yeah, I couldn't. I, when she walked in the door, I remember I had to leave. Like I was, I was so stunned that we had talked about her like four hours earlier, and she walked in the door. I'd never seen her before, and I was just like, conjured her. Oh my god! <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't even be in the room when she walked in. <laughs> and she was perfect when she walked. Like she's just perfectly her. Like it was literally as if Tammy Taylor just walked through the door. It yeah. was just. Too much, and we see we saw a lot of celebrities there, so we were fairly desensitized. Um, but anyway, I had a habit of sometimes, you know, we did this thing at work called the gift of service, where you're kind of this open, authentic person, you know, providing a guideway of, of the experience. And so I sometimes let that get the best of me, and would talk. <laughs> and so we asked for some agave to put in her latte and I remember being like I remember and I'm not sure if I'm making this up because my memory can embellish things big time but I remember her putting it in the drink and like we gave it in this little tiny white ceramic pitcher and she like you know tilted it over and then like lifted up the pitcher so it made like a long stream down into the cup and I just don't know if that's real or not but what was definitely real is I was like I go I love agave and she goes I love agave too and I go, 
it's easy on the bees. <laughs> she just like stops for a moment because like, what a weird thing to say. And, and she goes, because she's so polite and Southern, she basically, she, she, she said, she said, it is easy on the bees very uneasily. And it was basically like a Southern bless your heart. Like it was such a bless your heart. Um, that was a good one. Another, a time that I just laughed recently, my dog makes me laugh really, really hard. Um, I, I can't think of a really good one, but I was walking in the other night in this little, I, I live in an area where there are a lot of, um, a lot of bars, a lot of pubs, like in these converted houses. So they, you know, they look like houses just blended into the neighborhood, but they're just places for people to get extremely drunk. Um, and I don't drink anymore, and so I find, I, I'm, you know, I don't have a very complicated relationship with alcohol. People can, people can drink around me, and it doesn't, doesn't do much except make me happy because they're having a good time. However, when people are really, really drunk, like I just, it's either terribly annoying or terribly funny. And I was walking my dog late at night, and these two people came, you know, out of the bar, and this lady, they were so drunk, they were stumbling and. And this lady goes um, right into the middle of the road, and then she just fell to her knees, and she started fake retching. And I just was, it, it was funny, because she wasn't really barfing. If she was really barfing, obviously, this would be a different story. But um, <laughs> she was just pretending to, and I was like, God, she's that drunk. And there's no doubt that she got home and definitely did, you know, get sick. But um, but it was pretty funny, and my dog was really into it, too, because, you know, any time you make noises, they dog friend. Yeah. <laughs> Aww. Buckley. Well, Buckley, what a sweet pup. That's all, that's all for today, and then let's do it again. Yeah, let's do this again. I've had so much fun. We should, like, do a podcast. I'd love to. Lots more celebrity stories. Yes, indeed. <laughs> celebrity lunch podcast. That's the deal. Add it to the like, list. Uh, Couch model and celebrity lunch with a podcast. Wow, you do, uh, the best the best person is a renaissance person with a diversified social media presence. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I gotta say. All right, I love you. Thanks for having me. Love you too. Bye. Bye.